No? So the idea is to have a disk to disk to cloud implementation rather than disk to disk to tape. These two can be combined too as well. And uh, we do have our virtual machines running on hypervisor. We do have Veeam. We do have Starwind VTL connected to that Veeam machine presenting a regular tape library. And uh, then as tapes get backed up to Starwind machine, it will have local tape storage. So it's not tape, it's just spindles, but it will have certain amount of tapes local. And then the rest of the tapes will be replicated to S3 and then destaged to Glacier down the road when they're not needed. And so is that represented as slot ranges in each uh, that's tier? Per, per tape, yeah. So uh, the whole idea is to implement it uh, in software without any additional hardware and also make it transparent so any backup software can work with that. It will just see it tape device and uh, the backup and the restore process will be completely transparent. So you just need to fetch the tape from S3 or you need to fetch the tape from Glacier or you fetch the most recent backups from local tape storage. And it is all configurable. So you can, let's say, have the weeklies local, then the monthlies still running in S3, one of them and everything else just dumped to Glacier to save money and space on the S3 and on the local storage. And if things go completely to hell, then I can fire up the VTL in a Windows. Oh, for a VTL VT. anywhere, yeah. Catabone. Restore. And uh, we do have 14 minutes. I can show a small demo. And there is also a possibility to do an off-camera session if you want to have one. So a couple I would more questions. If sure. I um, Going back to the HCI offering, mm -hmm. keeping, in map, keeping in mind the roadmap as well, are there any plans to include things like container, containerization specific volume drivers, like a Docker volume driver or anything of that sort? So uh, we do have plans like that. I don't have the details. It may be Anton who has the details on Docker, if you have. Well, you know, uh, there's a lot of talking about the containers, but when it comes to, you know, to the real adoption, the level is not that great. So we do look at this one and we we pretty much know what to do and we're pretty much ready to do that uh, but we don't see you know the the point of non-return being crossed with uh, with you know with with this kind of uh consumer adoption that's 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 the point so it might be this year but it's not you know the the, the greatest plan it's not where we are you know Strictly focusing right. So, as a HCI offering, um, what about the setup? Is it as automated as all the other sort of leading HCI offerings like Nutanix and vSAN or um, you know VCF and that sort of offerings, or is it just manual? How does that work? The initial setup. The initial setup uh, is on the, on the factory end, and the only thing customer needs to do is uh, add machines to the domain and uh, create a cluster on top. So it comes pre-built? Pre yeah, it's come pre-built okay. and pre-configured. And also, the, it's, uh, the, there is a default storage configuration, so it would have the flash configured as a tier, but if customer decided, okay, I have just a few virtual machines which I want to be all, all on flash all the time, we also have an option to give him an all flash LAN and then a spindle LAN. Any limitations on the cluster sizes? Uh, the technical limitation is 64 nodes, okay. but uh, with the way we scale out, I would rather use it with VMware, but not yet with Hyper-V, just because of the storage management part of it. Do you support multiple capacity tiers, or is it still just a single capacity tier? Mm. Well, I mean, if you had, let's say, a couple of these devices in your, in your storage nodes and a couple of real SATA disks, you know, something like that. It can Could be you? mixed. Yeah, can be yeah. mixed between each other. Easily. Can it mix? Yeah, can be mixed. You can mix a physical drive, you know, to 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 to. S3 so, do you, you support want. the policies that would that would direct data from you know like the on local capacity tier to I'll call it the S3 capacity tier and things? Well, not at this point, but that's also possible. I mean, yeah. that's it's. So, if you intermix, then it would be it would be effectively random whether the data went to S3 or or local disk. Yeah. 
got another question slightly more towards the business side of it as opposed to mm -hmm. technical side. HCI market is quite saturated at the moment. You've got big players like VxRail, Nutanix to sort of new up and coming windows mm -hmm. backed by big players like Hyperflex, etc., etc. And where, where, where are your key USPs? Is that in the price or is that in certain technologies? I mean, we've kind of covered a couple, but are yeah. there any specific USP from a technological or commercial point of view that makes yours better than those guys? I would say that uh, still the two key reasons customers go for us is the flexibility and the price. Price, okay. Yeah. And can you define a bit more on, on flexibility? So the, let's say you bought Virtual Sun a while ago yeah. and you're using it and you grew out of your Virtual Sun environment. You contact Starwood and say, guys, I'm ready for hyper-converging my stuff. And we say, okay. And he can then reuse his Starwind license in the appliance. He can use, reuse his OS license, his Veeam licenses. All this stuff can be reused. So that uh, was a typical problem. When you get into something hyper-converged, you cannot really use the old stuff you got. And we allowed uh, re reusing all of it, including the storage virtualization stack license on it. Not quite. So if you have vSphere, it depends on... Well, the, yeah, it yeah. would depend. There are, so there are uh, cases where you cannot and cases where you can. <coughs> We, we just said by default that everything you had before, you can use it on the new hardware, as long as we know it and it's like not, not an ancient technology, we would support it. And then uh, the same thing happens to uh, customers using the hyper-converged appliance and then trying to scale it differently. So we had, as I said before, we had customers who said, okay, we start with the hyper-convergence, what happens if it doesn't work for us? And we decide to just shuffle everything and move to compute and storage, we would support it too. So there is no need to just destroy, destroy all the, cl the cluster and move. Well, the others can do that as well. So we, you know, vSAN, for example, can do the same. You can just strip out the vSAN license, stick a storage array behind it. Yeah, especially if you're going from VMware to Hyper-V. Right, okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that's another thing. So we, we support multiple hypervisors also. And there's a lot of customers, especially at the lower end of the SMB and mid-SMB, who are coming from VMware you know, to, to, to Hyper-V. And this migration is very, very painful to them because they, technically they have replaced everything at the same time. All, not only the hardware, but the operating system, you know, backup application, and you know, all, the, all, 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 all the process inside. And with us, this transition is completely, you know, completely, uh, completely painful. Uh, so it's similar to virtual, for example, painless. from HPE. So, so one of the challenges with using object storage as a disk and I think there are a couple of them, is, is eventual consistency issues and how do you deal with that? And the fact that every time you write something, you're creating another object, you know, you're not actually modifying, read, modify, write, or anything like that. You're not using log structure on the back end of S3, whatever it looks like, right? You're just writing S3 objects. Yes. So, I mean, how does this, so how do you deal with the eventual consistency issue? So I do a write, sometime later it actually gets to S3 and I do a read in the, in, in the, in the interim and it's not the data that I wrote. You have, you have to use this one in a configuration when it's used as a disk, but there's a special, let's say, uh, the purpose of this disk uh, is fre not frequently used a tier. So as a, as, uh, it, w it would be a bad idea to use it in a configuration when there's no, uh, no spinning disk or no flash on top of it at all. But if you do kind of the spoofing, like if you put a huge amount of flash or dynamic memory in front of it, so it kind of absorbs, you know, the, 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 the right pressure on it, it's okay. And also if you use it as a, as a local call tier, which S3 is essentially is, uh, then, it will be, then, then you'll be fine. Because what we do, we are not trying to, to really invent something new. What we're, it's a different way to plug in the public cloud into the configuration uh, where it's needed but it's not supported yet. Yeah. I was thinking you could actually do this for like a Mac backup disk or something like that, a SATA disk, and just plug this device in, but it's not that simple. No, no. Well, speaking of Macs, we've been known as a substitute for time capsule for a long while. Yeah. Yeah. I was surprised my friend told like, oh, you work at Star Wars. I use them for the time capsule. I'm like, 
Why? And then he told me the whole backup thing. I was really surprised. Right. Speaking about the flexibility, to answer your, your question more fully, uh, there is one key difference between hypervisor native solutions like vSAN and Storage Spaces Direct and Starwind. You only license Starwind on the nodes where it handles storage. If you have a massive cluster with, let's ah. say, Good point, yeah. Yeah, with a massive, uh, with let's say 10 nodes, but you're not doing storage on all of them, or you don't need storage on all of them. You only license so you, storage. You only start with, on two or three nodes. With vSAN, you need it licensed Compute on all of the answer. nodes, and with Microsoft, you need a data center license for every core in the cluster. Yeah, it's one of the things that annoys me that most about point. vSAN pricing is you pay the same if you're consuming or providing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically, the whole idea is Welcome filling the flexibility holes and saving people who fell into not really scale out and not really scale up. Are you allowed to talk about list pricing on this or is it something you need to take offline? I can watch the pricing and then talk to it because I'm really bad with numbers and really <laughs> bad with things. <data. laughs> but really the starting HCI cluster with two nodes would be sub 30K. And they think the smallest model, we, we currently scaled down to a four terabyte uh, cluster with each node having one eight core CPU, 64 gigs of RAM and something like four terabyte usable. The list price on that is, uh, is less than 20,000. Dollars, that, that excludes the hypervisor? Uh, that includes uh, either FreeSXI or uh, Microsoft. Oh, FreeSXI. Yeah. yeah, it that can run FreeSXI. Or you can just buy the OEM. Yeah, we're, uh, by the way, we're one of the few companies who can OEM VMware Essentials Plus into the system. Typically, okay. that's not something you get with the hyperconversion but offering. That's not a selling point. Well, it's that's not a selling point. It's just one more thing about the flexibility. Yeah. <laughs>